Turn please to 1 Timothy chapter 1. As you do so, may I welcome each of you to this Bible class. And we're glad to see you. We also welcome our webcast viewers. And we pray that every, everyone will know the Lord's help. And that God's Word will be a blessing to our hearts as we consider what He would have to say to us. As we continue with our study on the subject of the Christian and the moral law. And so we're turning to 1 Timothy chapter 1. And we will read together from verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior, and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope, unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father, and Jesus Christ our Lord. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying which is in faith, so do. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned, from which some having swerved have turned aside unto vain jangling, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men-stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. And we know that God will bless the reading of His own precious Word. Now, as many of you will know, First Timothy was written by Paul to this colleague of his named Timothy who was ministering in Ephesus at the time in view in this epistle. You learn that from those opening verses where he says in verse 3, I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus. So Timothy is still in Ephesus and he's ministering there at this particular time. Paul writes to him to give him instruction to give him guidance concerning his ministry. That is the reason why this epistle and Second Timothy and then Titus, all of them are known as the pastoral epistles, these three epistles, because they're written to ministers, pastors who are overseeing congregations and who need help and wisdom and guidance from the Spirit of God. And this is what is given by Timothy, or to Timothy, by the Apostle Paul. Now, one of the duties that Paul placed on this young minister was that of combating the influence of erratic teachers who were troubling the Ephesian church, and that is the thrust of verses 3 through to 7. One of the areas <clears throat> in which uh, there was this erroneous teaching had to do with the moral law. Look at verse number 7. It says, "...desiring to be teachers of the law." That literally reads, wishing to be law teachers, wishing to be law teachers, which means that they actually felt themselves equipped to be such, to be teachers of God's law. They believed that they had an understanding of it and could impart knowledge to others there in Ephesus. But Paul proceeds to show that this was not the case because he says in verse 7, and he's quite scathing, understanding neither what they say, nor whereof they affirm. And that is, as I say, scathing in a sense, but it's very true because these men, while they wished to be teachers of the law, obviously did not even understand what they were saying. As Paul tells us, they did not know what the law truly meant or truly taught and its place in the life of the Christian, because this is the point. They have gone to a Christian church in Ephesus, 
and they take on themselves to teach about the law of God, and yet they are, they're not bringing the, the teaching that will be a blessing to God's people or a help to God's people because they don't understand what they're saying. They do not understand what they affirm that they know. And so this is the situation that Timothy has to deal with. It's not an easy one, obviously, but he has to deal with it. Verse 8 would uh, tell us that they were not engaged in a lawful use of the moral law. That's what verse 8 really is all about. It says, but we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. And the inference of the verse is that these teachers, these who took upon themselves to teach about the law of God, were not teaching it lawfully, as Paul puts it here. They taught in a manner, in other words, that was contrary to the law of God and to the divine purpose and use of the law of God in the life of the Christian. Remember what I uh, what we've entitled this study to be, that is, the Christian and the moral law. And so Paul's actually showing us here that the moral law has a place in the life of the Christian. But then there are those who come along, like these people, whoever they were, and they teach in a manner that's not lawful. And they do harm, they do damage. They bring into, a situ they bring into the situation that's in this Ephesian church that which will only be injurious to the Lord's people. Now, their misuse of the law is then revealed in the words of verse 9, where he says, Paul says this, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man. And you notice there right away that this is the problem that existed, or this is the kind of erroneous teaching that was going forth. They were, they were bringing the law in such a way that it was contrary to God's purpose as far as Christians are concerned. And we're going to say in a moment or two what exactly that means. So their misuse of the law is revealed by those words, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man. Now the verb made in that statement, the law is not made for a righteous man, is a verb that, that literally means to lie. And uh, lie literally, I mean, physically, lying on something or uh, laying yourself down on a bed or a sofa. That's the sense of the word here that's translated made. And therefore, it signifies weight uh, as you carry it out, as you think about it. Something that's laying, and then it signifies weight, it signifies force, it signifies pressure, it signifies even stress. And this is the thought that lies behind what Paul is saying here. The moral law is not to be laid on a righteous man that is on a Christian in an unlawful manner. Otherwise, it will bring upon him pressure. It will bring upon him stress, a weight that is outside what the law is supposed to be in the life of the Christian. And so Christians in Ephesus, just to put it very plainly, they were being pressurized by these teachers. That's what was going on. They were brought under a weight, under a force in regard to this teaching of the law that was not compatible with the whole matter of the, of the law and the life of the Christian. The whole idea of what the Lord intends the law to be in the life of the believer. The one who's already justified, remember, because it's talking here about the righteous man. That's a justified man. And so there's a certain way in which the law is not to be used in the life of someone who is a child of God. So in Ephesus, these false teachers were laying the law upon believers in a manner that was unlawful. What was it? We're not exactly told here, but we can, we can actually, we can, we can assume or we can speculate, but we can do so in the light of other scriptures. What was the big problem in the first century church with regard to this matter of God's law? And it was uh, that believers were been forced, were been pressurized to keep the law in order to be justified. Now that happened in that first century everywhere uh, the, the gospel went. And it happened because there were Jewish men, Judaizers they are called. And wherever the apostles went with the gospel, these men followed after them. They, they, as it were, they, they dogged their footsteps. Wherever Paul went, 
Wherever other apostles went, like James and John, these teachers of the law, so-called, always followed after them, and they began to tell the converts in these Gentile churches, you have got to obey God's law in order to be justified. Christ is not enough. It must be If they brought Christ into it at all, these false teachers, they then said, it's Christ plus your obedience to the law. And so they took the gospel and they made it a gospel of works, a gospel whereby men can be justified as a result of their own effort and their own obedience to that law, which as we have been seeing in these studies is utterly impossible. Last week I dealt very much with that whole uh, study of the fact that the law on one hand is a covenant, on the other hand it's a commandment. And I'm not going over that again today, but that whole point last week was to show or to sum up and to to really bring together strands of thought that we've been dealing with for a number of weeks. And to show that the law is a covenant. Yes, it demands perfect obedience from us as human beings if we're ever going to be right with God, but the problem is we can't give it. And so the Lord Jesus Christ stepped into the situation. He gave the obedience that the law requires, and on that basis, His perfect obedience, we are justified. But these men went to Ephesus, and they went to Galatia, they went all over the place, and they told the Lord's people, those who were already saved, those who were righteous, that's what Paul's saying, the law is not made for a righteous man. They told the righteous, you have got to obey the law along with believing in Christ. So they just simply made it very plain and said, you've got to obey the law. And of course, they have brought into that the entire law that God had given to Israel, the ceremonial law, the civil law, as well as the moral law. And they said to these people, you've got to obey this and fulfill this if you're going to be right with God. So that is what I suggest to you was going on as well in Ephesus, because it was going on everywhere in the early church. And that is, as far as the Christian is concerned, an unlawful use of the law. It causes a situation where God's law becomes oppressive. It becomes burdensome because no one, you see, is able to satisfy the law's demand for perfect obedience in order to be justified. No one. And so, that is why if a person endeavors to be justified before God as a result of his own obedience to the law, he then feels a burden, he feels a load pressing on him that he cannot carry, and that's an unlawful use of the law. So that's the background here. That's why Paul is writing to Timothy to deal with this situation concerning those who wanted to be teachers of the law, but were using the law in that unlawful way. Now in these verses, here's the thing I want you to say today to begin with. In these verses, 9 and 10 especially, we actually find the Ten Commandments. So let's look at that first of all. Uh, As we think closely and carefully about verses 10 and 9, there is a presentation of the Ten Commandments in those verses. So it is the moral in those verses. So it is the moral law that Paul is talking about here as he refers to these teachers of the law. It's actually the moral law because we can see the Ten Commandments in these verses. Paul refers in verses 9 and 10 to various kinds of sinners. He says that the law was made for them. Notice what he says in verse 9. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man. Remember the meaning of the word made? It means to put pressure on. And when Paul uses that word, he then goes on to say, it's not made for the righteous man, but for the lawless. Which means, therefore, he is saying that the law should be brought down upon the, the lawless, the disobedient. Why? In order to have them feel their sin. In order for them to understand their guilt, the law must be brought down upon their souls in a weighty fashion to exert pressure on their consciences and on their minds to have them understand how guilty they are before God. And so, he refers therefore to different kinds of sinners in these verses on whom the law should be laid, that they might be brought to see their sin. We'll see more about that in a moment or two. But as he does this, he, he shows us the moral laws in view, and he actually covers all ten commandments. Now, 
in the first instance, he speaks of sinners in a general manner. Look at verse 9. He says, The law is made for the lawless, the disobedient, ungodly, and sinners. Those are general terms. The lawless, that is people who live as if there is no law, there is no uh, standard, no moral standard, no law that God has given. There are those who are like that. They live as if there is nothing of that kind, and therefore they're lawless. And the Bible speaks of lawlessness. And the word really refers to iniquity. A man just casts off any idea that there is a standard, there is a moral code by which he should be living. He just throws it aside. He's lawless. Then it says disobedient. That means that when he does hear about the law, he refuses to submit to it. And so these are just not repetitive terms. The lawless is a person who lives as if there is no moral standard. The disobedience the man who knows there is a law but refuses to surrender to it. The ungodly. That's a very strong word in the original Greek language. That signifies a person who has no regard for God for his being, for his uh, person, for anything about him. And you see, we're all ungodly by nature. Man is ungodly. Man is a rebel. Man is defiant of God. He has no regard for God in his own nature, in his own heart of hearts. Oh, he may cover it up or he may not, but he's ungodly. That's the state of the human race. And then the word sinners. As I said there, this is not a mere repetition. The lawless, the disobedient, the ungodly, sinners. Every word has a sense and a meaning. And the word sinners, well, we know this word well because we've often mentioned it. And it's, it's a standard word for sinner in the New Testament. And it means to miss the mark. And so it's uh, signifying a refusal to come up to the divine standard. And so he speaks in general terms about men as, as uh, sinners in these terms. But then he speaks in a more specific manner, beginning with the two words unholy and profane. In verse 9, you'll find those words as well. Now, those two terms are linked together, as you can see, unholy and profane. What is stated negatively in the word unholy is then stated positively in the word profane. The word profane comes from the verb that means to walk or to tread. So why is it translated profane? Because it's talking about a person who tramps on, who walks down upon uh, the things of God, the, 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 the ordinances of God, the mind of God, the law of God. And so a person who is, on, is unholy is therefore a person who's profane. Now the Bible says that Esau is profane. This very same word is used of Esau in Hebrews 12 verse number 16. If you want to look at that verse, you will see how the word is used there of this poor man Esau, poor in the sense of how he just rejected everything that he knew to be right. And it says in verse uh, 16 of, of Hebrews 12, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. And his profanity is shown by that line, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. God says he was profane. What was the birthright all about in, in Old Testament times? It was the right of the firstborn to inherit just not only the physical blessings of, of God, but it was the, the role of the person who, who came as a spiritual leader after his father and was to carry on the testimony of God within the family. And, and Jacob's the father here, of course, and, and Esau is the, the older, or the, the elder of the two sons, uh, the, the twins, Esau and Jacob. And he's the elder of the two, and, and therefore it was his role to be the one who carries on the birthright in that spiritual sense, but he sold it to fill his belly. And therefore, God says he was profane. He actually just, he trod upon the things of God. He tramped all over them. That's what he did. And that's why the Lord says he was profane. And 
Therefore, we see something of the use of this word. He was both unholy and profane. And so, going back to 1 Timothy 1, Paul here is talking in these two terms about the unholy and the profane. That is, those who trample the things of God, who profane all that is holy. Now, what's in view there? Well, I am saying to you that in that statement, the or though, though that phrase, the unholy and the profane, you're looking at those who reject the first four commandments. Because the first four commandments are commandments that command men to recognize the holiness of God. God says, no other gods before me, no graven images, do not take my name in vain, keep my day holy. Now what do men do in relation to those commandments? That is, those who are lawless, disobedient, ungodly, and sinners. As we saw that general description of men. What do they do? They act in an unholy way. They, they act in a profane way because they take the holy things of God and they walk all over them. So they profane the holy things of God. They are unholy and profane. The first four commandments can be seen in that language very, very clearly. Because when a man has another God, he's rejecting the true and holy God, and he's walking all over. But God has said, no one else is to be the object of worship but me. And furthermore, you're to worship me in faith and in spirit and in truth, not by the use of images. You know, it's really remarkable how the church of Rome walks all over those commandments. I was just reading recently and preparing for last Sunday on that message on Reformation matters, and, and it is sola gratia. And I was, I was just reading what Rome has to say about the commandments. And to this very day, she excludes the second commandment and divides the tenth commandment to make up ten. And so she walks all over it. She rejects the holiness of God. God has said, I'm not to be worshipped by images. And Rome actually says in her writings to this day that we worship God by images as a way of assisting us in our worship. She still says that. And so Rome is guilty of an unlawful use of the things of God, unholy and profane, she is in her teaching, even the first commandments. And then you got the third one, as I said, not taking the Lord's name in vain, and the fourth one, his day. And so, unholy and profane, that is a reference to those who reject and abuse the first four commandments. Then look at the next term here. It says in verse 9 again, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers... And you might think, well, that's the sixth commandment, but it's not. It's the fifth commandment, because it's dealing with fathers and mothers. And what does the fifth commandment say? Honor thy father and thy mother. And so here is a reference to the fifth commandment. Turn to Exodus 20. Exodus 20, verse number 12. And... We know what the commandment is. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. And then chapter 21 of Exodus and verse 15. And he that smiteth his father or his mother shall be surely put to death. And so there's the very thing that Paul is talking about. Murderers of fathers or murderers of mothers. And uh, he, he brings it out, uh, that is Moses, brings it out there in Exodus, the very same thing as Paul is talking about here. So there's no doubt that this is a reference to the fifth commandment. Then he goes on to say at the end of verse 9, manslayers, and that's a reference to the sixth commandment, manslayers. That would refer to all kinds of homicide, all kinds of, of the slaughter of other men in an unlawful way, manslayers. Then he goes on in verse 10, the first word is whoremongers and them that defile themselves with mankind. Whoremongers and them that defile themselves with mankind. This is obviously the seventh commandment. The word for whoremongers here is in the original Greek the word porneia. 
And you recognize the word because from that word we get the English word pornography. And in the New Testament you will find that, they, that this Greek noun porneia is used of every kind of sexual or moral impurity. Every one of them. Adultery between a married man and a married woman, fornication between young people who are not married, is also used of sodomy. It's used of them all in the New Testament. All kinds of sexual perversion. And then it actually goes on here to say, to specify, them that are abusers, or them that defile themselves with mankind. And that is actually a very clear reference to sodomy. The same term is used in 1 Corinthians 6 verse 9 where it's translated abusers of themselves with mankind. So here's the seventh commandment, whoremongers. The word refers to, uh, yes, whoremongering, harlotry, but also every kind of sexual perversion, including sodomy. But then he adds in those who, are, who, those who defile themselves with mankind. So there's the seventh commandment. Then it says men stealers. And here we have clear reference to what was going on in those days, that is slavery. And God is telling us here that slavery is a form of theft. Here is the eighth commandment, thou shalt not steal. What worse kind of theft could you have in a sense than stealing somebody and making that person a slave and selling that poor individual into whatever lifestyle it might be. And you know, folks, that's going on in our own nation to this very day. And so here is the eighth commandment. Slavery is in view in those words. We could go back to Exodus, we don't have time, but uh, it's, it's addressed there again in Exodus in relation to the law. Then, liars. Uh, it's the next thing that's mentioned in verse 10. That's the ninth commandment. And lying is a most evil feature of human nature because uh, it refers not only to speaking dishonestly, but to acting dishonestly. Uh, the, the commandment, thou shalt not bear false witness, it doesn't merely have to do with your words. It has to do with your behavior because you can, you can act dishonestly as well as speaking dishonestly. And so, again, it's a while, and we'll see this as we get down to each commandment in time and the will of the Lord. Uh, we can see how it's a very broad thing. And, of course, the devil himself is the arch liar. John 8, 44, the devil is a liar from the beginning. And then it says perjured persons. And that literally means a false swearer. And in view there, there's the Tenth Commandment in a very striking way, because the Tenth Commandment says, Thou shalt not covet. And men in their covetousness, what will they actually do to get gain? They will swear falsely. They will use some kind of uh, a false statement, a false manner of getting gain, and therefore they do it because they are covetors. And out of covetousness, they swear falsely. They, they are perjurers, as it says here. A man perjures himself. How does he do it? He swears falsely. He, he makes some claim, whatever it may be, and he does it to get gain. He, he does it to get ahead. He does it to, to make headway in life. That's all covetousness. And so all ten commandments are in view in these two verses. Now, having seen that, we've noticed already that Paul's talking here about the lawful use of the law as opposed to the unlawful use of the law. And so, going back to verse 8 again, he says, We know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. And then he goes on to show that the lawful use of the law is to be brought, is to have it brought upon those who are lawless, disobedient, ungodly, and sinners. And then he goes even farther to cover all ten commandments by referring to these kinds of people who are guilty of breaking the ten commandments. And then he states at the end of verse number 10, he says this, And if there be any other thing, that is contrary to sound doctrine. And so he's saying that anything and everything that's opposed to sound doctrine, for that's what the word contrary means, obviously, anything and everything that's opposed to sound doctrine, doctrine comes under the full weight 
of the law's exposure and the law's condemnation. And the inference is that the lawful use of the law is to promote that which is sound among men. Again, go back to verse 8. We know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. And then he, he comes right down and he says in verse number 10, if there be anything that is contrary to sound doctrine. Now the word sound, it means to be healthy. It actually gives us the English word hygiene. I think I've told you this before in different studies. The, the Greek word for, for healthy, uh, or sound rather, it means to be healthy, it means to bring health. And from it we get the English words hygiene and hygienic and so on. They all have to do with good health. So it's an interesting word. But here Paul is not talking about the health system of his day. He's talking about a society in general. And he's talking about the fact that the, the right use of the law promotes that which is healthy among men in a moral and indeed in a spiritual sense. And so if you go over to chapter 6 and verse number 3 of, of 1 Timothy, you find the word again translated in another way. 1 Timothy 6 verse 3, If any man teach otherwise, and he's still dealing with these men who are teaching in a manner that is designed to hurt and, ha and harm people. He says, if any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, and the word wholesome is the same word as this word sound. And so what are wholesome words? Well, they are the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the doctrine that's according to godliness, 1 Timothy 6 and verse number 3. And so going back to 1 Timothy chapter 1, <coughs> Paul, Paul is talking about teaching the law in a manner that will actually help society, in a manner that will bring about a more sound society, a more wholesome society. That's what he's talking about. And therefore, here is the lawful use of the law. Here is society that's already permeated with all kinds of wickedness. The violation of the whole of the Ten Commandments, he's talking about that kind of a society, and that's the, that's the way it was in Ephesus. Remember this? Ephesus is a pagan city. Every sin under the sun is committed there. Every law of God is broken. Every commandment is violated. And Paul says these characters come along and they carry out this unlawful use of the law. They, they heap it on God's people and they put burdens on them with regard to their justification. Whereas the law is supposed to be used to bring about a society that is healthy and is wholesome. What do you see from that? That Paul's teaching is now, the lawful use of the moral law is designed to counteract the wickedness of men and to promote moral health among men. That's one lawful use of the moral law, is actually to be applied to the ungodly, is to be taught in society, and for a number of reasons. Well, I've already touched on one of them. In order to reveal sin. We have touched on that already in our studies in this subject. The law reveals, the law condemns sin. Sinners must be charged with their wickedness. They must be brought face to face with their ungodliness, with their wickedness, and they must be made to feel it. And so in public, <coughs> excuse me, in public ministry and in the preaching of God's Word, there has to be the teaching of the law. That is why we teach our children in the Sunday school the Ten Commandments as part of their catechism course. They will cover the Ten Commandments and in other ways as well. That is why the Ten Commandments should be on display in preaching and in teaching. And you know, society hates the Ten Commandments. You may have read, some of you, about the United States and different instances in some of the states where uh, there are judges to this day who, who want the Ten Commandments up in the courtroom on the wall. And the liberals are continually uh, agitating to get them removed. That goes on all the time in the United States. You'll, United States. you'll hear case after case about good judges, godly men who are 
in that capacity as judges, and they want the Ten Commandments on the wall of their courtroom, and there's this continual uh, fight against it by ungodly and wicked men to get them away out of the road. They don't want to see the Ten Commandments because the Ten Commandments expose their sin and their wickedness in the sight of God. But that's one reason why the Ten Commandments must be taught. Secondly, in order to restrain sin. Uh, we've seen this, we've covered this, that the, the, the law of God is a restraint upon men, and the Bible teaches that in so many ways, for example, in terms of civil government. Romans 13, 1 to 4, and they'd write down that chapter. What is the purpose of civil government? It is to be a terror to evil. How can the civil government be, a ter uh, government be a terror to evil only when the civil government is upholding God's law? What is the civil government doing in our day? Undermining God's law. And so it's going against God's law. But the lawful use of God's law is that civil government should be upholding it, at least in terms of uh, seeking to pass laws that are compatible with what God says. And you know, folks, the only way that we'll ever get back to the civil government of a nation, our own nation, upholding God's law, is when the government is influenced by the church. But the only way the government can be influenced by the church is when the church is living according to God's law. And the church of Jesus Christ is experiencing God's power in revival and in reformation. And that is what we desperately need. And I tell you, when you look at the nation today, you almost, you almost feel this is a hopeless situation. We're so far away. Could we ever get back? But if you had lived in days before the Reformation or before the great revivals that came down through history, you would have despaired as well. Because in those days, the governments were oppressing God's people and passing laws to hinder God's people. And then suddenly God sent revival and society was transformed. That's the only way that the church can influence the state. Now, there's a separation between church and state. I just say that. They're two separate entities. The state is not the church and the church is not the state. That's the great, that's the great mistake that even a man like Martin Luther made. And he felt that the state should actually do the work of the church. But he was wrong. They're two separate entities. And the only way in which the church of Jesus Christ is to have any uh, bearing upon the state is by faithful preaching and teaching so that men in society will be changed and will become good citizens and make good laws. That's how it works. That's the teaching of this book. And that's the lawful use of the law. And in that way, sin is restrained. And of course, we must teach the law in order to, to reach and save sinners. Look at verse 11. And this is striking, what Paul says here. According to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. What is he saying? He's saying that the law is according to the gospel. He's showing here that the right use of the moral law is in harmony with the gospel. As the law is laid upon sinful men, by the Lord's grace they are brought to see their sin and their need of Jesus Christ, and therefore they're led to Christ. When I mean, we've seen this, the law is a schoolmaster to bring men to Christ, and therefore the law is according to the gospel. What a statement that is. What a contradiction of dispensationalism, which tells us that the law has nothing to do with the gospel. Paul says, the Holy Ghost says, that the law is according to the glorious gospel. He's actually saying that you don't preach the gospel properly unless you bring in the law and show how it has a weight, a bearing upon the ungodly to bring about their conviction and then their conversion as they're led to Jesus. And what a, state, what a passage this is. As I think about the Christian and the moral law, it has a great as we've seen, a great amount to teach us 
And may the Lord today write His Word in our hearts and help us to pray. We need to pray that God will bring about the kind of change that is in view in this teaching. And the Lord will again move in our nation. We must not just step back and say, it's all hopeless and helpless. Let's give up and crawl into a corner. No, we need to pray that God will move and God will work and bring about the kind of change that's in view here. So let us bow in prayer as we come to the close of our time and the Lord write His Word in our hearts. And Lord, we pray today that Thou wilt be with us and bless us as we have spent this time around the Scriptures and again have looked at the things of God. We pray that Thou wilt bless Thy Word to us and Thou wilt use it in our hearts and in our minds and lead us on with Thee, we pray, from strength to strength. And abide with us today and cover us beneath the shadow of Thy wing. And grant us help in all our gatherings in the time of prayer now into the morning service and right through the entire day that lies ahead, we pray in Jesus' name and for Jesus' sake. Amen.